everyone. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on yen, yet another episode of Unsuited. We're on our third episode today in season one. And like good corporate governance demands, we're going to focus on diversity today. So presenting our first lady guest. And wait, wait, wait. She's not just any lady. She's a lady who runs her practice with an iron fist. And her multitasking abilities are, well, what dreams are made of. She's built an empire and she's always, always accessible to her clients and her team, no matter the time of day or night. She has, well, pretty much, uh, how shall I say, well, the, the, the notion of the glass ceiling, she's completely shattered that and the shards have hurt quite a few uh, of her juniors, contemporaries and seniors, right, with the expertise she's brought onto the table. So without further ado, presenting Zia Modi. She's a mother, wife, daughter, sister and a grandmother. But one look at her and you know that she's a force to reckon with. Hi, Zia. Good evening. Thank you for joining us today. Pleasure. Good evening, Tanisha. Hi, Zia. Hi, Vikas. So uh, I'll kick off first and then uh, Tanisha will uh, we'll be doing a double act on you today. We were thinking beforehand it's going to take more than one of us to interview you. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to go back a few years, um, really starting with um, why did you choose to study law at Cambridge and then Harvard Law School? And then how did that experience impact you and your journey as a lawyer? So um, I left India to study law uh, simply because my mother did not want me to get married to my husband uh, <laughs> at such a young age. And when I uh, told her after college that I would like to get married, I think in uh, three months she put me on a plane uh, to England uh, without uh, any admission and told me to go and find myself a seat in college and study law and she would talk about it after that and then I finished my law like a good girl and uh, she decided that uh, it wasn't yet time for me to come back so she told me that I should trot off to America to do an LLM so that's how I landed up actually. Well, this is reverse of most stories of Indian young Indian women it's normally Parents are forcing their young girls to get married, even today. And here it's like your mom saying, no way. Uh, don't repeat that mistake <laughs> so early. Well, well, you have to understand, Zia, you, you have to be honest and tell us at what age did you meet your now husband and then boyfriend? Because we know he was the neighborhood boy and we know you started dating fairly young. So how young were you both? That's why mama wanted to keep you apart, right? I was around 15, 16. That explains it. That's what my mother says. <laughs> but you still went ahead and married him uh, at some point. And there's a very interesting snippet around that that you said in one of your interviews where your dad said, come on now, let her get married. She's 28. Otherwise, he's going to run off and say no. And exactly. That's my, ma my father came to the rescue. You see the... I'm a Baha'i by religion and under our Baha'i law, we are not allowed to get married unless we have the consent of both the parents, of both the spouses, whatever their religion. So uh, everyone else said yes, but my mother who's a Baha'i said no. Wow. So I had to wait, we had to wait till she came around and decided I was genuinely going to be uh, just not marriageable. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so Zia, Zia, have you have you told this story to Karan Johar? No, I think he would love it. <laughs> okay. So, and the, but how was the experience? Obviously, you, know, you got shipped off to England, then America to go and. And did she tell you to go and study law? Was that the thing, or just do anything? Just don't get married. I always wanted to study law, so that was not a, uh, not a requirement that came from her. Um, as I've said before, uh, I never really thought of any other career. Uh, probably my father's influence, uh, just uh, hearing him being slightly argumentative myself, 
Uh, so uh, it all added up. I don't think that was a, a very critical choice between law or something else. Okay. I like and, the fact you put in a slight, slightly <laughs> argumentative. <laughs> the interesting snippet though on the personal side is that since you chose to, to study and practice the law, I think your brother who really wanted to be a lawyer, uh, he, he didn't get a chance. Can you tell us a little bit about that? He's a doctor now as we understand it, right? So yes, that's absolutely right. My, uh, my, I'm the eldest. So my uh, sibling after me, my brother, uh, also wanted to be very much a lawyer. And I suspect my father wanted him to be a lawyer as well. But uh, my mother, if you call me a force of nature, you should see her. She basically said, one lawyer, go be, go be a doctor. So that's what happened. Wow. Okay. Wow. Uh, and how, so how was that experience? A in the family. So, so in that sense, you guys are, are pretty safe. Absolutely covered, especially right now. Correct. <laughs> Very relevant. Um, and Zia, how was that experience um, of studying overseas you know, as a young Indian woman as well? And what impact did that have on your journey? So uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, what I really learned was that, uh, you know, in India, we're, we're very good at memorizing. Uh, a lot of our uh, memory is uh, useful. Uh, but what happened to me when I went to England, especially, is that you have the, uh, the uh, tutorial system. So you go for your lectures where everybody attends, two, three hundred lawyers. And then you really learn in small classes of seven or eight or ten and that's where the tutor comes in and actually exacts and extracts the best out of you. And he doesn't want you to give back what you've read up or mugged up. Uh, he is asking you trick questions. Uh, he's challenging uh, your answers. Even if they are the right answers, he's putting across a different point of view and asking you to respond. So you very quickly learn uh, what I call the bottom line approach. What's the bottom line in this issue and what's the problem? And the researching also, uh, what I felt I learned was to deep dive into the relevant aspect of the problem. So if you had a particular issue, you looked for the nuancing within that issue. And that's when you started learning how to identify the key three or four trouble areas or the positive areas and so your ability to talk back, not in a negative way, but to, to, to debate, uh, to have an honest conversation. And more importantly, uh, a lot of times you are just wrong. Uh, and so how to figure out how to deal with the incorrectness of your thought process and how to bring it back into the logic that law demands. So law is logic at the end of the day. I always tell the juniors that if something is not sounding logical to you in your research, it's probably wrong. You've got it wrong. Go back and check again. So that's what I learned really. Uh, analytical skills and uh, the fierce requirement of logic. Fantastic. And that is, um, I know even looking at the Indian education system today as well, that argument still kind of prevails that uh, we're much more rote learning and high, we have a high high knowledge bank, but that whole ability to process and argue logically and rationally um, still is kind of, you know, not quite there in the Indian education system. It's getting there. I'm sure it's there in, in several schools. Hmm. Uh, it's not that you don't have to learn and you don't have to memorize. Of course you do. It's how you take that and then apply it to each fact matter. Yeah. Okay, super. And then obviously from, from there you went to, you know, you went to Baker's, you did about five years in, you know, in the US as a lawyer. Um, and then you, you covered M&A, PE, corporate law, moving into litigation, to Indian courtrooms, you know, and very, very much built a reputation of being you know, the queen of negotiation for corporate India. So tell us a bit about how you managed to switch so seamlessly between different practice areas you know, and also which, which one you actually enjoy the most. So uh, after being a corporate associate in New York, when I came back, there wasn't much choice. 
because don't forget I came back in the early 80s, 83, 84. And at that time, uh, there was no foreign direct investment. Uh, we opened up in 1991, if you recall. And uh, all I had when I came back was the courts. Uh, and so I uh, started uh, uh, appearing as junior counsel, uh, put my band and gown on every day. Uh, when I did not have work uh, in the beginning, which was quite often, uh, my father would uh, counsel me to go and sit in the courts of the various judges and to uh, study uh, the court. Uh, is he a landlord's judge? Is he a tenant judge? Is he a pro-labor judge? Is he a pro-employer judge? So, you know, know thy judge uh, was pretty much the counsel that he gave me. And so in the early years, as a young junior, you took whatever you got. And my father's uh, present to me when I joined the bar was about uh, uh, 32 or 35 copies of what we call the Bear Act, which is just the act, no commentary. And he said, this is the best thing that you can learn because don't forget, when I came back, uh, I had never studied Indian law in my life. And so uh, whilst, of course, it was Commonwealth jurisprudence, the statute is the statute. And therefore the counsel that I got was read each statute cover to cover like a story, like a bear act. Don't get fuddled by the commentary. And once you've grasped what the act is trying to do and where it's trying to go, then start applying it to your matter and then read up the commentary. So that's how I started as a junior barrister. And then, uh, of course, life became busier. I did that for about uh, 10 years plus uh, before I then morphed back into corporate practice. Um, and if you ask me how I did it so seamlessly, it was not at all seamless. Uh, because uh, after 10 years, I was wearing the hat of a barrister uh, who is the elite of our crop and our profession. And uh, my father was very depressed that I had morphed back into table practice. Uh, I was uh, wondering if I had made the right decision because I enjoyed the bar and appearing and arguing and getting more uh, single briefs, as they call it. Uh, but I think that the overwhelming rush of clients and queries that came to me uh, after India opened up uh, was such that I didn't want to leave that behind. I didn't want to give that up. And I tried very hard for maybe two years to straddle both, but it was absolutely impossible. I could not... Uh, could not let my guard down for a second in court because I would be one of the few women with a hundred men in the courtroom and it didn't work that I would make mistakes. And of course, your clients from overseas are not going to keep waiting for you to finish court, finish your conferences and then get round to their queries. So I slowly disengaged from appearing in court, sadly. And mm -hmm. then... Uh, uh, we started uh, uh, Chambers of Zia Modi. Did you, did you feel that pressure, like you mentioned, that being one of the very few women in court in a male-dominated structure, did you feel that pressure of having to be better than them? and uh, being Not better, uh, but certainly I didn't want to be uh, tripped up. Uh, and uh, because there were so few women that would actually be arguing, or effectively assisting. Uh, the pressure obviously was on, not only, not necessarily from my peers, my juniors, my fellow juniors, but more from the clients and therefore the solicitors who would send me briefs. So the client would always have, I think, maybe a slight question mark as to, I was much thinner and more petite and uh, the, uh, the client, I'm sure, had a question mark, is, is this girl going to manage? And why is he giving it to this uh, young girl? And therefore, in order to justify the faith that my solicitor had reposed in me by batting for me, 
uh, I used to work overtime to make sure that uh, even if we lost, it was not because we hadn't done, I had not done anything. That's actually very interesting and insightful, Zia which is actually taking us to our next question. Uh, I know that a lot has been said about how you treat your clients. Uh, your clients have said it, your partners have said it, your juniors have said it. Pretty much anyone who's had the advantage and privilege of working with Zia Modi knows how Zia Modi treats her clients. That said... How uh, does she? Beautifully. <laughs> you, you're, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that your bank balance is reflecting how well you treat them. So... <laughs> You don't want to hear it from us. <laughs> so jokes aside, uh, you know, while the client is so important in, in uh, you know, the kind of work all of us do, right, the practice of law, there is something very peculiar about you right from your early days, which is that you always offer the client the right opinion. And you're not so fussed about whether it pleases them or not. Their reaction is, is always unimportant. You want to do the right thing by them. And I'm sure that this is never easy to pull off, at least not when you're just starting off your journey like you were sharing in the previous uh, couple of minutes. So how, when did you first find the courage to do this? And where did you learn this to begin with? So frankly, it was not such a great revelation or an effort because don't forget, as a counsel uh, arguing in court, uh, again, what my father always told me is that you are first an officer of the court and everything else follows. So you, I never grew up with the uh, mindset that you could argue anything to please a client and get a victory. Uh, what mattered was the credibility of your case before the judge, which is facts, facts, facts and law. And the facts could never be twisted. They could be nuanced, could never be twisted. And uh, what mattered again was the personal credibility that you had to develop with the members of the bench and your fellow members at the bar. So it came very naturally in the sense that, you know, I didn't have to be some virtuous uh, female to have this quality uh, beaten into me. It was just practical. Uh, again, as my father used to tell me, uh, you say one thing wrong before one judge, it doesn't stay with that judge. They all talk at the lunch table. Right? So uh, the way I was uh, trained was as a counsel to present the facts, uh, to keep the uh, uh, hat of the officer of the court above all else. And frankly, uh, you know, most times that was absolutely good enough. Uh, if the client had a bad case, uh, the expectation management had to be done before you went into court. You couldn't finish telling him you have a thousand percent victory when he had a bad set of facts. Uh, and I was guided by a great senior. I had a senior called Obe Chinoy, who was my father's junior. And uh, his daughter was later my junior. Uh, but uh, <coughs> that was his DNA as well. Even in the drafting, when you draft and when the judges are reading what you drafted, because your name is there, right? Drafted by Zia Modi or settled by Zia Modi. Uh, how you present it is always critical. Uh, you can de-emphasize stuff, you can highlight stuff, but you can never keep back stuff. Sure. And uh, so, so when you say, how did that translate into MNA? It was a natural. Uh, you would tell your clients, uh, the reality check. Uh, I'm not stupid as to, you know, go into the first meeting and tell the client, you might as well commit suicide. But the way you present the facts, the way you draw it out of the client, the way you uh, put the weaknesses, the strengths all in one bucket, in one hotspot for the client to look at the whole picture. That is the key. So he understands what is black and what is white. Very little is black and white. And then there are all these shades of gray. And then you basically, partly it's instinct. You know, what do you feel? What is your gut? That instinct grows better with experience. But even then, uh, you can sense something that is looking malignant. You can 
then something that is looking benign and you know the various shades in between and i think that early on uh, when i was younger uh maybe life was such at that time that clients didn't like you saying that oh you can't do this or this doesn't work uh and maybe there was more of a can do ecosystem uh life has completely changed now i think what the client values today is if you tell them the level of risk uh and each client has a different risk appetite but he wants to know what you think or she wants to know what you think of the level of risk so that's how uh clients now appreciate uh because you're trying to lay the path forward to say okay you want to do this today but that's fine but these are the possible ramifications uh it looks likely unlikely highly likely and now you take your call so i think that's how i that's how i've done it all these years so zia it sounds like um what you once said in an interview with et now that lawyering is very much similar to psychological counseling so the kind of what you're saying now about the advice you're given it sounds very similar similar to being a counselor to your client that's when the clients don't want to hear the truth then you go into a counselor mode <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is because you know everybody's human especially your client and he deserves all your care affection and uh, attention and if you don't put on the hat that he has of his worries of his requirements of his wanting to do a deal really badly of him being in a competitive process where he wants you to put him in a position that is better if you don't understand that and you give out dry theoretical advice how does it work Uh, today i am essentially a transactional lawyer 80% of the time and so what should be my goal to get a deal done in the right possible way and uh, it's not my business to say you should give up this or give up that i can guide him and i can tell her that uh, you know normally we don't do this or i think you can push back and get away with it but ultimately commercial decisions and the check is theirs and so they expect me to understand what is passing through their mind uh why they want a certain thing so badly or why they want to avoid a certain thing so badly so that's the counseling part i think yeah i think um that's great advice even even in today's era where um the gc especially in india is more empowered than ever before and we're constantly hearing this debate about um lawyers need to come across as advisors the business and understand the client's business more than ever and i think you know what you were doing 20 plus years ago or even 25 plus years ago is really relevant even today so i think that's great advice for even younger lawyers and younger partners um you know who are kind of struggling with this power shift to clients becoming much more heavy and much more kind of um sophisticated especially in india so i'm going to pick up from what zia said and you know zia you said that everyone is human right uh, and to err is human so of course failure is very much part of being human in lieu of that you've said in one of your interviews that to you failure means not being trusted will you help us understand why that is such a critical value that you hold so close to your heart i guess because if your client doesn't trust you why will he listen to you right at at my level is not coming to me for drafting the severability clause right he's coming to me because he wants my gut uh which is going to shape the way his particular transaction or his regulatory issues go forward if he doesn't trust your judgment why will he come to you can talk to his wife or she can talk to her husband is coming to me because there is value in what i am telling him which takes into account not just the law but law plus 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 have there and have there been moments where you felt like you've not been trusted and that's not felt very good i think maybe a couple of times uh i may have pushed too hard and the client may have felt that you know 
why is she doing this? Um, but I don't think I've been in a position where I feel my own client doesn't trust me. Sure. You, I think when you say push too hard, you're also the kind of lawyer who's just so passionate, right? About uh, not just about her own work, like not just the law, but also the business of your client. That when you say push too hard, I can very well imagine you saying, no, don't do this because it's not good for you, right? I can fully imagine you being that person sometimes. Is that you sometimes? And also very often, I think, you know, the mature clients understand that part of a good lawyer's job in a transaction uh, is also to see what the other side can give and cannot give, right? So you have to wear the other side's hat internally when you're discussing with the client to say, can he really be pushed on this? Or can we trade this? Or can we keep this last? Or what is really a deal breaker for us? what would really be a deal breaker for him. And therefore, when you play that dual role uh, within an internal conference with the client, then, you know, it all flushes out as to what, what will it take to get the deal done. Sure. Excellent. Um, on that point, uh, side point, uh, one of your mature ex-clients, Prasanna, says hi. He was typing away. Well, he's a, he's a great man and he was very kind to give me a lot of briefs as a junior and he encouraged me to argue so I will never forget press. Um, and you were talking about the kind of values and skills you brought to the table with your clients which is why it's a high level of trust um, and you're known as a scrupulous fact checker and a truth hound. So are, are these natural talents that you had or are they, are they kind of skills that can be honed and developed? Which skills? Sorry, because I couldn't hear you. It was a, a scrupulous fact checker. So that your sense of fact always checker. finding facts. Yeah. Fact. So, F -A -C -T. Facts. Fact checker. Ah. And, and, and a truth hound. And, truth and a truth hound. hound. True? Truth. Truth hound, Zia. Truth. truth hound. Truth hound. Okay. No, I think that what I developed as a junior counsel, which I think I took to my m and uh, table, was that uh, if you don't have the facts, uh, you will 100% be wrong when you argue. And if you don't have what uh, a lot of the lawyers at AZB laugh about, uh, a perfect list of dates, then you will definitely go wrong. So what I learned as a counsel is wrong list of dates, loss. Right list of dates, good chance. Right? So... That's the truth, right? The fact checker. The data, the data, the data. Then you combine that with what is the law. Now, today, for a lot of that, I depend on being briefed properly. But even today, in about 50 to 60% of my briefings, I will look at the source. I will say, show me the section. Show me the judgment. Show me the paragraph. Show me the regulation. Because I still have uh, an insane requirement uh, to be ready uh, in my own head before I go in and either talk to my own client or the other side or a regulator. Because you can't be caught napping on domain. You can only be a good senior m &A lawyer if you have domain. You cannot turn around in the middle of a session, which is a negotiation, and ask the lawyer next to you, what is that section? Then that is the section which is key to the negotiation, right? Mm. So fortunately, uh, I would say 99% of the time, everybody knows how I like to be briefed. Uh, some lawyers do it better than others. It's a shorter briefing because they know what the heart of the issue is. Some, takes, uh, some lawyers take a bit longer. And if I don't know something, I think the best thing that I have learned, again, uh, from my days as a junior counsel, is to say, I don't know this, I need to check it, rather than trying to just bullshit my way through the discussion and get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So even in court, if there was a judgment which I had looked up, which was awful if I was in that position, but if there was a judgment sprung on me, or the judge asked me a question I was not ready to answer, and I wanted to be more thoughtful about it, I would tell the judge, I need some time. 
And I think that <clears throat> that honesty uh, of not having to uh, pretend that you know everything all the time is very important for young lawyers and older lawyers. Because uh, I remember there was a uh, uh, young man called Javed Khan who used to head up Blackstone in India. And Blackstone at that time was, you know, the client to get and still is. And uh, basically he came and he was interviewing all the law firms and uh, then he came back and he said, uh, we'd like you to work for us. So I said, great. And then he said, uh, do you know why uh, I uh, chose uh, your firm? I said, no. He said, because I asked you several questions and you said, I don't know to two of them. And that was important for me. So I didn't even realize that. That came so naturally. So I think that an acknowledgement of the fact that we don't have to know everything all the time, uh, but we must know most of the things most of the time. Uh, and the domain with which the opposite side respects you is critical. So if I start on a legal argument and I wash away into a nothingness and the guy opposite me says, oh, she's just, you know, bullshitting her way out of this. That doesn't work. That is not what I'm paid for. That is not what the client will expect. And so I try to combine uh, not too much detail with enough detail and constantly worry about the fact that my domain should be up to date. You know, I'm going to say something here. The Grey Matter team, so Neha, Shreya and I have all worked with Zia at some point or the other. And I'd like to share this that no matter what time of day you were meeting her, no matter how much content you were going to her with, whether it was many large files or just one single sheet of paper, that one error on that sheet is what Zia would miraculously pick up. <laughs> You're standing there literally biting your nails going, oh God, please, oh God, please let this be error free because you have checked the document about 10 times, right? You, you're now looking, the documents become a blur to you. And there you go. In the first five minutes, Zia has miraculously picked up that error and said, why have you come to me without checking this? And you're like, I'm sorry, <laughs> I tried. So, you know... I learned, I don't know if I learned, but I observed that skill set from Gulam Mahanwati, with whom I used to, uh, for whom I used to be a junior in a few matters. That man had the ability to speed read in a way I've never seen anybody else before. And while he was busy speed reading, he would catch the smallest of smallest of errors. And Gulam never shouted. Uh, he would get quieter and quieter the more he got, you know, cheesed off. And so the lower the voice, the more you felt, oh God, what have I done? But he would pick up right from conceptual issues to uh, how you phrased an argument, uh, to the use of your language, uh, to provide a better adjective if you needed to in your court pleadings. And so I always marveled at the fact that he could look at the macro and the micro. I'm sometimes accused of being too micro, uh, which is probably correct. But I think the, the ideal combination is a bit of both, right? Maybe more macro than less micro. Super. Again, I think again, um, Zia, super advice for the younger ones listening as well, because you don't often hear um, lawyers, you know, ha having the confidence to say, I don't know. Right. And especially, you know, uh, within the legal community here as well, so, you know, it's not often you get many partners, managing partners, having the confidence, you know, and that culture of being able to admit, I don't know this, we need to come back to you. And I think that's great advice, again, to you know, lawyers think, out there. Uh, because most managing partners would behave the same way because they know there is no brownie point in saying something incorrect, right? It sticks with the client that the managing partner got it wrong. So I don't think it's there. I think uh, probably what the young lawyers need to do a bit more of, if they need uh, counsel from a 63 year old, is that <laughs> a lot of them try to get their answers from their QB neighbors. What's the story here? What's the situation here? Oh, what did you do in that matter? I think the imperative 
as far as I am concerned, is to validate what your thought is by going to the root of the matter. If you're asking somebody to talk to you about, you know, section 27 or section 28 of the contract, first of all, have you read it? Have you read the explanation to it? Have you read the commentary behind it? Have you looked at some key cases on those sections? And then you have that discussion. Because if you have it without your own research, you are bound to accept what the other guy says because you don't know better. When you do that, it's just piggybacking of someone else. When you study it for yourself and talk to someone, it's a healthy debate. I think that's the difference. Excellent. Um, what, what's really obvious and I think well known about you is that you, know, you demand excellence. You know, and that's obviously you've had great mentors to help shape that. And you've got a reputation, as Finish was saying, of a taskmaster as well. Um, but do you, do you feel that kind of pressure then that may, come, you know, may then transfer to your team? Um, is it possible for others to really give their best when they're constantly knowing they're going to get caught out somehow? And, you know, we're, we're having to go to Zia, who is going to pick up a floor somewhere. You should ask them. <laughs> I think my expectations are clear. Yeah. I require a briefing after thoughtfulness. Right. I don't like stupid mistakes coming to my desk because they've not been thought through. I appreciate a different point of view, which I'm happy to debate with and even happier if I'm wrong. But uh, what I don't like is sloppy preparation. And so maybe that's where I get upset. <laughs> Does, does your voice go higher or lower? Higher. <laughs> no, no, not true. Not always. Sometimes she's just sitting there and staring at the sheet and you're like, react, react, do something. So I know if this is going okay for me or not. <laughs> and, and when she looks up at you and smiles, you feel like you have won the world over that day. <laughs> Thank you, Tanisha. I thought you were going to leave this audience with the impression that I just never appreciated anybody and bashed up everyone. You, you know, <laughs> I'm telling you, seeking your approval meant so much to all of us. I'm telling you, it, it made us hungry for validation. And, and very rightly so, because I'm telling you, we always went back to our desks, and this is private conversation that you're now privy to, Zia. We went back and said, how does she do it? She always picks up on the right stuff. Why are we so foolish? You know? <laughs> so well, I'm 63. <laughs> <laughs> we have so, to wait, Tanisha. We have to wait a couple of years. You, you a lot more years, me a couple. Correct. You Correct. tend to sift through. You tend to sift through a lot of stuff as you get older, simply because you just had the experience of dealing with so much more that, as I said, it's the original training. What is the bottom line? True, true. And also, I think your ability to just, uh, you know, to always know, I, I think it's got something to do with reading our faces also at some level. You just know that, you know, they've walked in here not doing enough, uh, you know, background work. And, and so you'd kind of pick up on the vibe. I think Zia is also a very intuitive leader. Tell us if I'm wrong, Zia. Most senior leaders are intuitive, isn't it? You can't not have a leader being intuitive. I think, I, think, uh, yeah, I, think, sorry, I think a lot of Tanisha's guilty conscience is coming out now. <laughs> she did fine. She did well. She doesn't have to. See, I'll be like, please refund that money I paid you. All those salary checks, bring them back home. <laughs> never. <laughs> so kind. Thank you. But jokes aside, then, there was never a time we walked out of a room without learning a thing or two, either about the issue at hand or about ourselves. So for that, I think we'll, we'll be eternally grateful, Zia. This is on YouTube, right? Everybody can hear this, right? <laughs> yes. yes. Anyway, I put it as part of the induction process. Now. Please do. It's now part of your HR manual. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Um, and the next question, um, given, given kind of your knowledge, your reputation, and how much you have to give to corporate India, um, you sit on very few boards. As a non-exec director, you only sit on a few boards across the country. So um, why have you chosen 
uh, to be so restricted in that and not be on more boards as a non-executive director? So I don't sit on any boards in India. I sit on uh, two or three boards abroad. But uh, from the very beginning, uh, again, my father's advice, uh, never to be put in a position of uh, whatever sort of, again, not being able to speak out in the sense that, you know, you don't want to be confrontational uh, on a board that values you. Uh, I always felt that I was much better ser serving the client by sitting outside the board itself and by guiding them with honest advice, which sometimes the board may not find palatable. And uh, to then sit there and advocate a position uh, which uh, the board may ultimately disagree with just meant that you are putting yourself in a situation of unnecessary confrontation. One. Next is that, I mean, as we see today, what's the charm in being on a board necessarily, right? Uh, it's uh, so much liability. There's so much gateway responsibility that the regulator puts on you. It's difficult uh, to keep track of what is going on. And if you are, God forbid, caught, you know, with the flashlight in your eyes, as a professional, who needs the mental trauma of trying to save yourself from all these liabilities and inquiries? Uh, and, and, and for what? Uh, you never get more work, is my belief, by being a director. You may get less work if the board is cheesed off with what you're saying. Uh, and if you want to please the board, and that is at the cost of your honest advice, then that's no good as being a director. Mm. So we have always felt as a firm that we should avoid directorships as far as possible. And uh, I am personally not a director on any listed company or a client's unlisted company. Great. Uh, Rasanna has thrown in a question for you. For um, What advice would you give to young aspiring general counsel? So I think the role of the general counsel has also morphed for the better. Uh, Prasanna was one of the general counsel, even in his times, which where he crafted the role very, very responsibly and took a lot of accountability of uh, the outcomes of the advice on himself. Um, otherwise, a lot of general counsel were seen wrongly, I think, as just being an intermediary between the company and the lawyers. The role of the general counsel has become much more responsible, much more meaningful, uh, much more onerous uh, with all the responsibility, especially if you are in a listed company as general counsel. Uh, you take the case of uh, Shubha, Shubha Mandal, who was with us, as you know. Uh, he has, uh, you know, one of the most interesting and challenging jobs of corporate India as GC of Tata Sons, right? But with that comes again, uh, what are the same requirements? Domain, time, psychological counseling, firefighting, intermediation, collaboration, the trust of the other side. All these qualities are now required in a general counsel more so as they grow older. And the younger GCs, basically, I would say, have to develop in themselves enough confidence to be able to not keep running to outside lawyers all the time. That counts, that confidence comes with what? Domain, right? So a general counsel, to my mind, has to spend as much time reading, knowing, staying up to date, having his own knowledge management as any outside lawyer. And I think the general counsel, if you ask me, has the benefit of looking much more into the business than an outside lawyer would have. And that again is very critical. To know the business much more and intimately is to be able to advise better on the risk taking and the 360 degrees. So if somebody comes to me with an issue, I can deep dive into that issue. I can, from a common sense point of view, say, how will it impact this? How will it impact that? 
but the general council will actually know how it will impact many other things other companies the same issue coming up in other listed companies in the group the same issue having been dealt with in a particular way the same issue where one of the group companies got screwed in a particular way all that business data and business uh, management uh, is something that is special to the general counsel and and his or her team well, i think great advice again for young lawyers cuz uh, young gcs especially we're, we're going to move on to more of a personal one in terms of um, you grew up with um, three boys and then as a mother you raised three three young girls um, how did you manage that balance between being you know a daughter then a mother setting up your own firm um, how did you get the, the kind of work life balance and be able to manage all of that so now you're asking me to go publicly on what i've said in many interviews i have had no work life balance and uh, you know that has always been my regret uh in the beginning um i got married in 84 i had my kids in 86 87 and 1990 so quick succession fortunately at that time i was at the bar and so being a junior barrister or just being a a counsel uh you have the luxury of just saying i don't want to do the matter you can't do that in an mna uh, context in a law firm so uh at the time when i had the kids and you know for the time that i was at home with the kids uh it wasn't uh difficult to take a break at that time but those were not long breaks and so as i've also said very often uh i lived with my mother in law who was the bedrock uh of the home and the reason frankly that i could continue to be a hard working lawyer uh and then uh kids grew up i don't ask them what they missed uh i don't uh, ask them how much they resented me i can only hope that now when they are in their 30s and have kids of their own they can understand maybe and be a little proud but uh um, cause it's a journey of constant guilt with a capital g mm. it's uh, the quota of guilt that varies from decade to decade uh but it's it's always been a struggle and i think for most women they will resonate with this it is a struggle and uh, how you manage your support system how you manage the ecosystem at your work um most importantly how you uh have a hopefully happy life in your marriage which mm. goes up and down when stresses come in and you know time is the enemy time is the enemy so for a woman that's the key sacrifice mm. have you have you managed to transition to um the other capital g grandmother yes uh, again i don't ask my daughter what she thinks of me as a grandmother because i know her her uh, marks will go to the grandfather uh, <laughs> but yes <laughs> I mean who wouldn't it's it's delightful it's another world Okay super Thank you thank you so we're going to transition to um uh, Manisha doing uh more I don't know don't say fun but the demonstration round and the interrogation which is Manisha's speciality <laughs> thanks vikas right. so zia this was you know like a detailed chat we just wanted to hear your thoughts on a bunch of things now we're going to do something more fun hopefully you've never done anything like this in an interview before hopefully okay so the next round is called the demonstration round we give you a chance to show us a skill that you're good at now you can't run away from the fact that you've been a trained bharatanatyam dancer we know this you played the piano you used to also knit you've also gone horseback riding so now which of these skills would you like to demonstrate today none <laughs> what a pity <laughs> so so then okay if not a skill can you show us something that's very close to your heart maybe is is that something you're probably comfortable to do what am i going to show you i have a piano downstairs which i don't play okay my husband has horses which i don't go and see or ride okay i don't do bharatanatyam anymore i don't have time for knitting or cooking 
But do you so, still dance? So Forget the Do you still dance though? Does that like what can I get? I dance you? at the farm retreats to give everybody a laugh. <laughs> Okay, fair. So, so I think Ria, I, you are in a position to share some pictures, uh, which are actually pictures of your dogs with your dogs because you, yeah. you're, you're big pet people, as I understand. Mm. So, tell us a little bit about the pets, the dogs that you live with. <laughs> Ragni, stop it. Uh, so. Uh, so my husband is more the dog lover, but I love dogs too. And at one stage we had, I think, nearly 20 dogs in various uh, places. Uh, in our house, we had uh, six Labradors and one Jack uh, Russell. And uh, so we've lived with dogs all our life ever since we got married. I lived with dogs even before I was married. So in this picture, you can see uh, three of our labs. Um, great companions, great de-stressors and uh, we still have three with us. Three died unfortunately but three are still with us. He's still with you. And so when you get home, uh, no matter the time of day or night, are they the first ones to greet you? No, no, they are sleeping by then. then. Sleeping. Okay, so the doorbell or the clicking of your key doesn't wake them up? There's no doorbell. I come in, I take the lift, I go up and make sure I don't wake up my husband. Okay, fair. And, and then do you see them off in the morning? Is that your time with them? When, when do you end up spending your time with them? Weekends. Weekends. Okay. And they're just like four balls for you to just like hold and cuddle when you feel like I'm guessing. Well, now they're older, so they're less cuddly. But yeah, when they were pups, they were completely adorable. Okay. And uh, you know, they're just natural distressers. Correct. So. Correct. And they, they, they just have so much love to give, right? Absolutely. And unadulterated. Correct. Correct. Okay. Super. All right. So then we know that Zia loves her dogs. What are their names? Do you, do you want to say it? Like, what, they, what, what, do you, what do you call them? Well, my favorites who passed on were Neo and Nala. Okay. And then we have some nutty names. Uzo, Luca, Vito. My husband loves naming them after Godfather characters. So we got right. those. Okay. Super. Thank you for sharing that, Zia. Zia, I think you can stop sharing your screen. We trust everyone could see the pictures. Okay. So that was the demonstration round. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Moving on to the interrogation. Now, Zia, we know you can be really funny. You, we know you're quick-witted. And we know you have no restraint sometimes when it comes to your humor. I'm truly hoping that you can exhibit that in this round. Briefly with me and then in the second part with this surprise element that's coming in. We'll talk about that shortly. So are you ready for the interrogation, Zia? Will you Better be, be nice, Kanisha. I'll be very nice, I promise. <laughs> I know the repercussions. I don't want a lawsuit from Zia Modi, I promise. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Are you ready? Will you be quick? Will you be fast? Will you be, will you be your witty self? Will you be your unadulterated self? Okay. <laughs> Super. Okay. So, for your first question in the interrogation round, what can instantly put a smile on your face? Like, instantly. And my lawyer comes in and tells me when, uh, AZP lawyer comes in and tells me that after we worked on a deal, the other side came to us for the next deal. Ooh, nice. Okay. We, you know, Typically, lawyers worry about poaching of, uh, you know, resources in terms of like lawyers. Zia wants to poach clients. Priorities on point. Very good. Very good. Okay. Your next question then. Time or money? What is more valuable? And don't say billable hours because time is money. So you can't say that. Time is precious. Always. Time is precious. Much more than money. Okay. Okay. Super. What are your top three weaknesses? Impatience, uh, getting angry quickly, and uh, you tell me what is my third, Tanisha. You know better. I'm not here anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think generally, you know, just not giving enough of time, speak time, if you like. 
to uh, people where I uh, interrupt sometimes more than I should be listening. Okay, okay. Super. Takes a lot to admit weaknesses. Thank you for sharing those honestly, Zia. So now, if you want a lawyer, what would you be? No, nothing. God knows. A debater. A debater. Actress. Act actress, I can believe with all those pictures we've seen. No, no, no. Not from a looks point of view. Just from a role model. A role play. Role, okay. Role plays. Fair. Okay, next question. How many hours do you currently sleep, Zia? And how many did you sleep, say, when you were in your 20s or 30s? I sleep five hours a day. Throughout. Throughout? For never an eight hour sleep cycle ever? Weekend. That's it. Well, it's getting better now because of this wretched corona. But, <laughs> uh, no, normally I get about six. Well, no, five maybe. About six. Between six okay. and seven. Okay. On a but good day. slowly bit. increasing the number. <laughs> Is it just so that it sounds better? Or do you truly manage yeah. seven? I don't want anybody to think that I'm sleep deprived and so I give bad advice. Right? No, but so how, how much did you think you slept maybe when you were in your 20s or 30s? Did you, did you get more sleep back then? No, no, hmm? not really. Because when I was uh, a junior, uh, I used to, uh, and there were no computers to look up case law, right? Right. It was physical. And uh, so I put in a lot of hard work at that time. As I told you, for a combination of not wanting to be called out as a woman, not wanting to be called out because I hadn't really done Indian law. Correct. And so I put in a lot of intensive time, but for different reasons, uh, just to basically become a good lawyer uh, in my, uh, in my, uh, at the bar. Correct. And now the time is differently spent. It's on judgment scores, fighting fires, uh, counseling clients, uh, firefighting for the clients, uh, firefighting within the firm, on issues, opinions, yeah. etc. True. Do you, do you ever take like an afternoon nap during a work day? Like just close your eyes? No, God, sleep. never. Never? Never. Oh, ever. you've got some excellent uh, DNA there then. Lots to thank your parents and forefathers for. <laughs> it's called Parsi blood. Always winning, always winning. Okay, my next question is, uh, what is the longest time you've stayed away from your Blackberry in hours? Like, I'm not going to ask you days. I'm asking hours. Depends where I am. If I'm on a holiday and I promised my husband, then maybe seven or eight hours. Okay, and on a regular, say, weekend at home, what's the longest you stay away? I don't stay away. You never stay away. Why should I? Fair. Okay. How many emails do you read and reply to on an average each day? Three, four hundred. Three, four hundred emails a day? I read them and then I reply to maybe, I don't know. I don't know how many I reply to. Forward, push, pull, combine, talk, collaborate, connect. <laughs> wow. Some are junk. Some are nonsense. Delete. But, but there is not a single email that hits your inbox and misses your eye. Would that be right? Sometimes it does, but that's where my uh, EA, Sharda, uh, makes oh. sure that she catches the slack. And so Sharda if I've missed anything, so I've missed anything, she brings it to my attention in a very quiet manner saying, have you read this? <laughs> Super. Okay. Now, you are a bit of a celebrity in the legal world, let's admit it, right? So, please share a moment where you were treated like one and didn't know how to respond. I've seen you, I've witnessed it live, so you can't say there's been no such moment. You got me, Tanisha. I mean, you know, what is celebrity? I think it's just peer recognition. Uh, I don't think I've been celebrated and I missed the trick or... Uh, was not celebrated and missed the trick. I know no, there so. has, there, I've seen you in one moment. So, like, let, I'm talking embarrassing moments, okay, Zia? Like, I'll share mm -hmm. one on your behalf. Yeah. We were recently at a uh, award ceremony where you came in with your mom and you were being awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by this pu international publication. And there was somebody who runs 
I don't want to get into what, but like, you know, ancillary legal business. Okay. And this person was physically pulling you. Okay. And prodding you and pushing you to take a picture. And we could see that you were getting mighty irritated, but you just have to kind of, you know, how like the celebrities have to do it. Like a Deepika Padukone has to just smile because, you know, she has to humor all her fans. So it was one of those moments for you. So do you have any moment like that that comes to your mind? I've shared one on your behalf, taken the liberty, sorry. So tell us a moment like that. No, Tanisha, there's nothing like that. If I was irritated, I would have been just, you know, a nice patient, 63 year old at that day. You were very Chalo patient. Yes, you were adorably point. patient. <laughs> okay, cool. So then that, I guess I answered that on your behalf without your permission. Okay. My next question is EQ or IQ, which is more important according to you? So it depends for what, right? If you are a junior lawyer, mm -hmm. IQ is critical. As you morph into a more senior lawyer, you can't be a good lawyer without the EQ. Um, I think the EQ allows you to put a coat of reality checks and practicality uh, on the IQ that you have. The EQ allows you to read a room better and transact better, to gauge your opponent better, to deal with him or her better, to stand down easily, to not pick a fight for the sake of picking a fight. Uh, EQ allows uh, ego to not rule if, it's, if you're smart. Uh, so, you know, I don't think that a really good lawyer as they develop can manage without both. If you have only EQ, that's of course fantastic. But if you are abrasive, you can't read the room, your point has to be the right point because you're so bright and everybody else is dumb and there's an intellectual arrogance that creeps into your thinking, then that's not good, right? So if you ask me today uh, at this age or any managing partner, they should have maybe 60% EQ and 40% IQ. Because I IQ is a given, right? You're not going to be a good lawyer if you're dumb. True, true. Thank you. That's a good distinction there in combination as well. Now we're going to become a little, we're going to make it a little more personal. So, you know, Zia, you can pretty much lay your hands on anything you want, right? You just have to set your mind to it and the world is your oyster. But the one thing that kind of stands out about you consistently is your simplicity. Like the pearls that you wear, which you're wearing today as well. We love them. They're your trademark, right? Uh, we don't see you do the flashy diamonds or the, the very well-known brands all the time or eating exquisite food. That's just not you. There's a lot of humility uh, intact. I'm very curious to understand how, how do you manage that? You know, you're so simple in your ways of, of being. Very basic, if I may use the word. So, I really want you to talk about that, please. So, I don't think I have these humble qualities. I think it's just no time, right? So, uh, why do I wear pearls? Because in my purse, I have a little pouch where I have different pearls and I carry them in my purse and anytime I have to walk into a meeting, I put on one set of pearls. It's easy, no time. <laughs> sure. uh, do I like jewelry? I love jewelry. Would I ask my husband to buy me big diamonds every day? I would. Uh, but, uh, you know, where's the time to keep changing stuff all the time? There isn't. Um, so, I think you can boil down to that. In terms of food, again, it's time. There's not much time to eat lunch. So, uh, there's no point to ordering from glitzy places where by the time it comes onto your table, you've got an urgent phone call and the damn thing goes cold. <laughs> and uh, I love, uh, you know, diet food like puri bhaji and uh, uh, stuff like that. So I think uh, just a quick bite, uh, too many quick bites, as my uh, daughters say during the day. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's not that I don't like good food. I love a wasabi. I love uh, so many other restaurants that I enjoy going to. But when there's time for a a two hour meal or a one and a half hour meal with the kids or with friends or with youngsters or juniors. 
Understood. So it, it kind of boils down to time for you at, at many levels. Followed. Okay. Speaking of food, we know that you love your idli vada sambar, your pizza and your Chinese. Now tell us your favorite places to order these from. Idli, pizza and Chinese. I think idli soma orders from Purnima. Okay. Across the street. I think uh, Chinese food I think Sharda gets to China Garden okay. most of the time. Okay. And uh, pizza, my my faithful uh, you know, Avinash orders from uh, God knows two three places which he knows I like. So he rotates them. So when I want a pizza, I, one day he gets it from one, one day he gets it from another. So all these are you know sort of standardized pairs for me. Sure. And you have a long-standing relationship with cold pizza anyway, right? Because Chambers of Zia Mobi and the 12, 12 members back there uh, essentially survived on cold pizzas is what you've said in the past. Totally. So, <laughs> that stays on. Absolutely. Okay, super. So tell us, Zia Modi now in her 60s or Zia Modi in her 30s? Which one do you prefer? Probably Zia Modi in her 70s, you know. Okay. But I'll become mellower. You're going to become He's a bit, he's out a bit. I don't know. I think it's different values, different uh, different sense of achievement at different phases. Uh, actually, when I was 30, I was, you know, a junior counsel with two years at the bar. Nothing much to show for. But a lot of fire in the belly lot of uh, ambition to show that I could make myself count and uh, you know not just be a another person in the in the background so a lot more passion to prove at that time today I think a passion to want to continue uh, the path of excellence for the firm as an institution uh, to feel happy that the next rung of leadership we have is, uh, you know, totally part of the AZB DNA, as I call it. Um, and to sort of look back and see what more one can do. And as far as the path forward is concerned, I think how to just keep upping yourself a notch all the time at an institutional level. And for me personally, not to want to lose my skill sets. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that honestly. Moving on, one very important part of, you know, Zia Modi and working with her is the parchis. We all know the parchis, the little tiny notes that you will make and write to everybody, personalize it with our names on top and all of that, right? But there are just so many people you work with and there are so many parchis. How do you effectively manage these parchis and maintain them physically? Because the one thing to notice, you always know what you've sent to whom and when you've sent it. So there is no saying to Zia, oh, I didn't receive it. There is no option to say that because you know exactly on which date what was sent to whom. So tell us how you manage this. What is the system behind it? My parchi system has become less effective. But what I do is I don't challenge my memory. And so because I have so many things in my mind, whenever there is a pending item, which I need to follow up on, I just write it on several small pieces of paper. And then as they get done, I scratch them out. And when there are too many scratches on one page, then I make a new parchi, which has all the other pending items from all the other parchis. <laughs> Sometimes I don't get around to them and they're so old that, you know, time takes the consequence of that. But most times, uh, so I think the, the everybody reminds themselves in different ways. Uh, and I think that uh, there is no point testing your memory on things you don't need to test them on. And that's how the my note making on my parchis has become a part of a way of life. And I date each parchi. So I know when I put it down and how long I've taken to get to it. And if I've taken too long, I know that I've screwed up and I need to get to it often. So I have my own internal diary if you like which everyone laughs at 
wow that that sounds but it's a very effective system it's working for you seamlessly so everybody can laugh about it but it's that's what i tell very them very effective yeah you so keep laughing you do your own thing you you keep laughing till you get the next parchi from zia then we'll see who's having the last laugh <laughs> okay very quickly then my almost last question what do you think what do you think goes through the mind of the opposing lawyer when they see you enter a negotiation room i have no idea i think there would be different thoughts for different people some would say oh god here she comes <laughs> some would say i better get ready better some may say okay now her client's been so bad she's going to bash him up in front of me <laughs> some may say oh boy i don't know uh i think most times they would know that i've come in because there's something that needs resolution uh and uh i think most times most of the people who i have worked with my professional peers would expect me to be fair um they are used to a little agitation from me at times it's not malignant but most times we do walk away with a solution simply because if you are willing to both wear uh, hats that are commercial and reasonable uh, you get a deal true true and speaking of you know your opponents uh i'm going to make this announcement very quickly zia's uh, one of her peers her oldest one of her oldest friends is going to join us shortly to take over the second part of the interrogation uh, mr rajiv lutra but before i invite him zia my last question to you is what do you who do you recommend to be our next guest on unsuited do you, you want to suggest a name ask deras deras kambata Okay, super. We will. We will say Zia has asked. So please, please do the honors. Is that okay? That's how you got me on this one, right? <laughs> you know, you know that Neha used to be a recruiter, right, back in the day. So she has this effective mechanism of pipelining. What can we say, <laughs> Mr. Lucha? Please, the stage is all yours. And uh, as promised, we look forward to a lot of uh, banter between you and Zia. So please switch Rajiv. on your camera. uh good evening all good evening zia uh i'll keep my video off for a while right let me quickly tell you i've been stalking zia for many many years and there was a matter we were doing together and i couldn't find her then i discovered she was in new york i happened to have and she was living with her daughter i happened and she doesn't know how i i, I got to this but i'll tell you the story today zia this is many many years ago I rang up the daughter's house and she said no mama has gone out uh, to some 5th avenue starbucks or something uh I got the number from 711 the 711 or 411 whatever you call and I called the starbucks and the starbucks there were no cell phones then the starbucks guy picked up the phone I said there's a lady who looks like a foreigner but is probably wearing an indian dress can you spot her he says of course sir uh, I can spot her and uh, he call i said call her quickly say it's an emergency so she came on the line very befuddled befuddled and i said hi zia she says lutra how do you know i'm here huh? how do you know how did you find me like a zia just look behind you there's a camera <laughs> <laughs> hi zia and hi all so this is very quick this is much quicker tanisha is a, a absolute scary pook she has asked me to ask all the tough questions because i am about 1100 kilometers away i am in delhi and i also have a shield in case zia yeah, you get painful so i'll wear that but rajiv quickly. where will you go ultimately hopefully and this is the one reason i don't want this corona to continue hopefully it will <laughs> and you'll be in lockdown but you will on eventually that note, come to peninsula park i think zia at this rate <laughs> tanisha don't interrupt to good looking people you can ease drop i'm going to go zia the camera <laughs> i i hope you enjoy yourself with mr rajiv lutra see you <laughs> Right. Zia, so for my first fire.
Uh. You've been referred often by your youngsters, by even your daughters, lots of times by your husband, number of people in your firm, number of your clients as a charming dictator. I don't know, benevolent or satiated. We'll talk about that. And by some, they say you're a controlled freak. I'm aware of some of that. If we took control away from you for 24 hours, what would you do? I'd go to sleep. Ah, so that's how we can increase that five hours to a little bit more. Okay. Correct. Zia, when do you feel satisfied? You did mention about getting a, another, your opposing client referring you work. That's a smile. But when do you feel satisfied? A good day. Generally, no tension, no fires. No, some that's good not point possible. Of law, no some tension. good debates. No that tension. Good family settlement. Arriving mm -hmm. at, you know, a nice conclusion to what could have otherwise been a bad fight. Ah. Uh, stuff like that. That's nice. Azia, since we are all living in this lockdown situation, God forbid uh, your doctor brother walked into the house and said, Zia, you have to go into quarantine. And you, madam, are allowed to choose three lawyers to quarantine with you. Who would you choose? Rajiv Lutra. Then, uh, and whoever Rajiv Lutra wants to bring with him. Have you guys noticed that she's going to make me suffer even in quarantine? <laughs> exactly. That's how special she is. Exactly. <laughs> Zia, who are the two women and one man that you attribute your success to? Two women. Two women is easy. My mother and my mother-in-law. Got it. Reasons. Got it. One man, only one man, my husband. Oh, we'd love to hear that. I did call him about 40 minutes ago, by the way. It's on YouTube. No, so he hear it. No, no, I did call him 40 minutes yeah. ago to give me some info. He's a rat. Didn't speak up at all. Now, we, we've heard about your horseback riding. You mentioned it, this, that. You mean to say, and piano and Bharat Natyam. You mean to say you have no hobbies now? Zero? Apart from bullying... Uh, managing partners of other law firms. Any other hobbies? Bit of reading, Raji, but really, even the reading, if I get time, are my Baha'i writings, on which I'm so behind. Uh, reading articles on management, I don't know if that's a hobby. Hobby really is traveling. Uh, and that's not a hobby, it's just that it's a way to get away, uh, spend uh, a week at the most, maybe a long weekend, just catch up with the family. Uh, maybe we don't even go to new places now. We just go back to the same places that we are familiar with and we like. If you ask me, my R&R &R is uh, quick getaways. Hmm. What have you missed most during this lockdown? Paper and people. Mm -hmm. Do you play poker? Not at all. No cards. No cards. I play a no. good game of rummy. I haven't played it for years. And uh, no gambling. No gambling. Baha'is can't gamble. Oh, they can't gamble. Sorry. Zia, if you woke up and you found you were in the armed forces, what position would you take? And you were allowed to choose any position. What would you do? Depends on which position you had in the army, Rajiv. It would be on top of you. I'll be the chief, Zia. And I'll be the And there's nothing on top. There's nothing on top of it. Okay. Can't fight with you on that one. Okay, I'm trying to bring this to an end. Uh, Zia, what's your next mountain? Time. Next so mountain. Mountain to climb, time to do things I want for myself. So what would that be that you want to do for yourself? Be more of a family person. Do more Baha'i activities. Mm. 
So your next mountain is more Baha'i activities and be a more family person. Get my balance sheet ready for... Hmm. Now, do you realize by saying being a more family person, and this is on YouTube, can you imagine what's going through your husband and your daughters? Because you'll be more on their head than now. That's what happened when I threatened to take a sabbatical uh, 15 years ago. The uh, person who was most worried was my mother-in-law because she just couldn't handle the fact that I would be 27 at home. But I think that now both my husband and my children wouldn't mind seeing a little more of me. Maybe not 100% doses, but certainly more than what they get of me now. I think what the lockdown has done is been great because my husband and I are here 24-7, which has never been there before. My one daughter, Aditi, is with us 24-7. So that's been a great, you know, outcome. Uh, but let's see, travel more together, be more together, be more with the grandkids, stuff like that. Very basic stuff, nothing exciting, Rajiv. Uh, Zia, I've known you for a little over 35 years and uh, I've seen you climb many mountains and every mountain you've climbed I've witnessed and you've left that mountain breathless. May the next mountain also you climb, madam, you leave it breathless too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zia. You're a sport and I'm glad to see you continue to remain a wonderful one. God bless you. Be safe. Thank you, Idex, for this opportunity. Normally, I wouldn't have dared ask her some of these questions, but it was Tanisha who was hiding in Mumbai made me do that. Stay safe and well, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening and dream of Zia. Thank you, Mr. Lutra, for doing this. Thank you, Zia, for coming on, spending the time, honoring our request. It means a lot. And it's always lovely to chat with you about all things non work Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. You too. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a good evening. Bye.